This is the Heroes Podcast. I'm back again, Andrew Hoffman, the doctor of self-worth, and I've got someone here from North America, Randy Kay. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Well, I'm fantastic because I know <laughs> we're going to have an amazing conversation because all I remember that you got a note sort of 35 years ago that your husband just disappeared. So I've always wanted to find out what happened after that. But before we get there, uh, so our guest today has lived a life of reinvention, expanding the possible again and again, including creating and recreating her own businesses to fit into her life as an actor, mother and grandparent. Wow, this is exciting. Her passion is to share these lessons of resilience creativity, and humor to help others to live happier and generate the energy to reach their goals. Please welcome actor, broadcaster, and the author, Ben Behind His Voices and Happier Made Simple, Randy Kay. I'm so happy. Do you want to tell us what happened? Like, what was the beginning if you were not sort of the solution person in 30, 40 years ago? What was the beginning of your story? Um, whoa, that uh, so leading up to the disappearance. All right, very briefly, I knew from a very young age that the way I wanted to make a living was as a singer and an actor. And in living that kind of life, there's a lot of uncertainty. I lived in New York, I lived in Los Angeles, I traveled around the country, I did some touring. And when you try to live a life on stage, you very often ignore your offstage life. And I had an epiphany where I was like, hold on, I can't live my whole life trying to be famous. I need to have an offstage life or none of it will mean anything. Fame is empty if you don't have family and a foundation. And right after I made this revelation, this man rolled into my life and swept me off my feet. And within a year, we had gotten married, moved back to the East Coast together. And I found out I was pregnant. So I proceed to be married seven years as his addictions became clear to me. I did not know him that well, I guess, before we got married or closed my eyes to a lot of things. We had some very good years. We had some very sober years, but things started to unravel. When my children were three and six, my son was six, my daughter was three, their dad called and said, I love you. Daddy loves you. Just want you to know I love you. And we never heard from him again. Nothing. Disappeared. No idea where he went. No idea if he was dead or alive. Obviously, no child support. Obviously, no closure for my children. And so there I was, a single parent with a big mortgage, an inconsistent income as an actor, two heartbroken children with no funeral, no closure, no, it was just an open gaping wound and faced with the Herculean task of keeping my family together financially and emotionally. It was 12 years before we found out where he had disappeared to and solved the mystery because I was left with a big mystery to solve as well. So fast forward to today, I I am I still have a home, paid the mortgage. I'm in a successful second marriage. My children are grown, but it has not been without challenges because my son developed schizophrenia, which was our second huge challenge. But the lessons of resilience and strength that I learned and continue to learn and creativity are what um, keep me going and keep me happy. So that's a bit of my story. <laughs> wow, it's, it's a mouthful. I'm staggering even to, I, I want to know, what. where did he go? What, what, what was happening? Did, is it okay to share? Sure, sure. So 12 years after the disappearance, the internet became more searchable. And I was able for a small fee to find him. And he had gone to England, he had gone to Greece, and he had come back to America and 
had not contacted the family and was deep into addiction. We had a brief phone call and then another five years went by. And then I got a phone call from him on the West Coast saying, I'm down to my last dime. I'm sober. I almost died. I want to come back. And so I contacted many therapists and decided what to do and actually brought him back to where I live so that my children, who are now teenagers, could get some closure. Jesus, I'm, get, I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. you kind of closed the chapter and, and moved on. But before we move on, I, I've got another question here. How you were able to help your children to process this, to to find an explanation because their little minds obviously needed some kind of peace or closure. How did you manage this? That's a, a very insightful question. Thank you. One of the lessons I learned so much from this was forgiveness. So the first thing I needed to do was obviously acknowledge their pain and held them when they cried, admit that I didn't know where he was, but I was going to do my best to find him. But also what I did was not blame him. I blamed his illness of addiction. And they were very, very little. And I said to them, your daddy has a sickness and it made him leave us. He didn't want to, but the sickness won. And maybe one day he'll get well again and come back but I don't know, and I will never have this sickness. In my wow. own heart, I had to, I did not want to be a bitter woman because being a bitter woman would only make me impossible to be with and not a very good mother. So I chose in my heart to forgive him. I mean, I was sad, I was grieving, there was some anger, but. I would never remarry him after I was able to divorce him, but I chose forgiveness and empathy for his struggle because I wanted to feel whole. So I hope I passed that on to my children, but I always acknowledged their pain and encouraged them to talk about their pain. There was one time when my son said, mommy, my heart is in like four parts and part of it loves you and that's fine. And part of it loves me and that's fine. And part of it loves my sister and that's fine. But there's a part of my heart that loves daddy and that always hurts. So the fact that my children could talk about their pain, I think was helpful. Uh, but that, you know, again, you don't have the closure or the community support that you get when somebody dies and you know what happens. So I did my best. I got them therapy if they needed it. I, I I supplied as many male role models as I could and just tried to model strength and forgiveness and empathy and fun and being happy anyway. This is unbelievable. This level of wisdom and being able to help them through this because, you know, these are the, the conversations that I have, you know, grown ups who mm -hmm. went through this experience are normally trauma therapy. It's, it's a massive release work that they've been stuck in for, for decades. And, and also I would find out how you were able to then get him back into this family with 10 years a, a gap of non-existent relationship. I, I can't, I, I wouldn't even want to be in that situation. How did you do that? Are you familiar with an old television series called The Twilight Zone? Mm. Have you? I know we we come from different countries and you've lived internationally, but that's a pretty international show. It's just when things are too weird and you just kind of like, okay, I'm living this right now. So I remember when he called me and asked for my help. And I said, well, let me think about it. Here's my boundaries. I can offer you a bus ticket, not a plane ticket, and a week in a motel. And after that, you're on your own. I had to set, always have to set and be clear about your own boundaries before you do something like that. This gave me five days while he was on the bus <laughs> across the country to think about how I was going to handle this. And I needed that time. 
Now, remember, I hadn't seen him in 12 years. So at the time when his bus arrived, I was the bus station happened to be right near where I was working. I was a, a, a broadcaster on a radio station. It's kind of a cool job. And I I was finishing with my shift and I went downstairs to meet his bus. And off the bus comes this old man who looked well-groomed. He was British and always it was important to him to be well-groomed, but all his possessions in plastic bags. And I, it felt unreal. It felt like I had moved to another universe. I don't know how else to describe it. I had made my plans. My son was at, was at his therapist. I was going to bring you know, my husband, well, now my ex-husband at this point, to my son at the therapist so that they could have support while they saw each other again. But it was surreal. And you know what I had to do, Andre? I had to hug my husband, hello, and say, you know what? I I don't even feel like I'm living in this world right now. This feels like a dream. So I'm going to take you upstairs and show you where I work because I had to be grounded by my reality. Does that make any sense? You know, mm -hmm. so I so we went upstairs and and I said to her, this is my ex-husband. And people were like, oh, <laughs> you know, it was really, really weird. And then I drove him to the therapist down the same streets we used to ride together. It was it was very surreal. And it took a while to get used to. And then, you know, the reunions. But I remember when my son, who was, I want to say 17 at the time, was um, 17 or 18 and having troubles of his own, which I thought this would fix, might help anyway. I remember when we checked my ex-husband into the motel. And the woman behind the counter looked at my son and said, oh, you look just like your father. And his face lit up like, because he'd never heard that. His whole um, framework of reference was you look like your mother or you don't look like your mother. This was the first time in his memory, conscious memory, that someone had said, you look like your father. So and then when my daughter came home, they had a, a more awkward reunion. Her first reaction was, I don't need him. I've never needed him, but I'll meet him. But they sobbed when they met each other. And he stayed around for a, about another year and started drinking again. And then his stepchildren, his other children, sorry, my stepchildren in England said, maybe he wants to come back here. So we sent him back to England. And now I'm aware of where he is, but I think my kids got the closure and I got the closure that we all needed. What a story. Yeah, it's weird. Yes. At least I knew what happened. He had spent the time escaping responsibility and then sinking into drugs. Tough. And uh, do you want to tell us, uh, so you've been doing your acting career while you were bringing up these children, yes? And did you have to travel? How did you even think that you could have your acting career along these years? I had to expand, which is, whether you have a crisis or not, it's very good to always look at yourself and go, okay, what did I want out of an acting career? What did that mean to me? What does that mean to me now? There was a time when an acting career, I was fine going on the road and doing a bus and truck tour and touring around in a theater show. At this point in my life, that was not okay with me. I was not going to leave my children and do a theater tour. And you always want to look at your business, especially those of your listeners who might have a business. You really want to look at the whole of it and go, what are my values? What matters to me in the whole picture of my life? Obviously, I wasn't, you know, I could leave my kids for a day or an overnight if my parents could watch them. That wouldn't hurt them. But to leave them for a month, I wasn't going to do that. My number one priority suddenly became being there for my children and having enough money so that they could not starve. So I had to and got to, I like to use got to instead of had to, I got to expand my vision of what an acting career was. And I actually took a class. I went to a local college and took a career direction class where I solidified my values. 
And she said, okay, name three things you could do that are similar to acting. And one of them happened to be radio broadcasting. I had always been curious about being on the radio. And like many people, I was like, oh, but how do I do it? And I don't know if I can learn it. And do I need to go back to school? And there are all these obstacles when we have an ambition. But I also was fueled by necessity. And I ended up, you know, swallowing my fear and asking radio stations if they needed any announcers. And the first one hired me. I, I'm, I'm One of the things I'm working with now in 2024 is that success is in the asking, not in the results. And so I was just pleased with myself for asking. And I also believe sometimes things are meant to be. And I just happened to be, they happened to need a part-time announcer. And they would, they would teach me what I thought I didn't know. So that morphed into a 17-year radio career, ending with full-time with benefits employment at that radio station. I did afternoons and then taught drama in my kid's school in the morning. So I didn't feel like I was, you know, a workaholic mother. And then later when they were older, I shifted to morning radio so that I could be with them in the afternoon. So it's always reevaluating why you want your own business or why you want the business you're in and how does it fit in with the values of your life. So, and on occasionally I wanted to do theater and I did it in the summertime when the kids weren't in school and they came with me to rehearsals. I went all year long, it's about you in the summer, it's about me. And they would come with me to rehearsals and they got to see what it looks like backstage. And then occasionally they, you know, we had babysitters and, so I, I would do theater, but not all the time. I would do occasional film roles, but not all the time. Radio was my full-time gig. Teaching drama in their school was a great gift because I got to be part of their school lives. I knew all their, ki all their friends. I knew all their friends' families because I was their teacher. So it was weird for them sometimes. And because of that job, which again is expanding what it means to be an actor, I got to learn how to write a play, how to direct a play, how to make a curriculum for third through eighth graders to keep them interested in drama. But I still consider it part of my career as an actor. And as being a local celebrity on the radio, I also got the opportunity to do more theater, to emcee some shows, to make speeches, so that now my career has expanded to include keynote speaking and uh, doing workshops for people. I'm not a coach. I have no coaching practice. I don't want to do that as my business model. I like to be on stage using my art to teach and entertain. And I think everybody has to look at their own careers and say, what works for me? What am I happy doing? So everything leads somewhere. And that is where I continued to reinvent my career as an actor. And just this summer, I did another theater show. So it's still there. I can't believe it. There's been so much gold in in what you said. That is about flexibility, mm -hmm. about knowing what's what's most important, right. and being able to then move towards that with with an open mind. And then you you said as well that I I picked up is is asking guys if you're listening ask and knock on the doors it may be the first door maybe the 10th one or the 15th one uh, because you keep knocking and i think the bible has has a line to this as well mm -hmm. and and the door will open for you in a way delivering what you are looking for as long as you are keep knocking and searching for for what you want so it's amazing so can what? I add something to that? Yeah. And that is that sometimes if you knock on a door and they never answer, maybe that's not the door for you. And I think that that is still a success. I have written two books, as you can see behind me. I don't love writing books. I do not really want to write another book. These two books got written because some spirit got into me and said, Randy, write this book. So I feel like 
everything aligned that the book needed to be written. But it is not the lifestyle I want. I do not, even when I write a blog post, I, I'm always glad I did it and the time does flow, but it's not my happy place. My happy place is being with a team of people. I'm a collaboration queen. I love collaboration. I'm so delighted mm -hmm. you invited me on to here because for me, I feel that we bring out the best in each other. People bring out the best in each other and some work has to be done alone, but not all of it. So I think if you're going down a road, like I was going down the theater road, before I was married and had kids. And, and I got what everyone said was a plum job, a job on a touring equity. Equity is the um, American theater union and you have to qualify to get in. So I, I joined equity. I was so excited. I got an actual paying job that paid well and had benefits touring all around the country. I thought it was what I wanted, traveling all around the country and being paid to be on stage, but I didn't love it because I was in the chorus <laughs> and I really wanted it, it, you know, for some people that's enough for me, for me, it, it wasn't what I wanted. I needed to be able to express my art more than I was able to do in the show. So I didn't see it as a failure at all. It was an experience that was like, okay, I, I kept my commitment. This was great. I did my best. I enjoyed it, but I'm not doing this again. Not this, this isn't what I'm meant to do. And I think that if you're knocking repeatedly on a door and that door doesn't feel right anymore, it is a success to walk away from it and find another door. That's what so, I've done repeatedly and I'm still doing in my life. That is just so smart because I do see people who have been living in that room where the door opened 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and they don't realize that life is full of empty not even discovered rooms for every one of us and and i believe if you did enjoy that role or that adventure there is always more that you may have learned about yourself or what you really want and obviously you had the children as well to just put some necessity on so what would you say is your so how are you helping people now if if you could call it that way how are you serving community how are you serving people i think that we don't always see the results of what we do i am working on and have been booked to do keynote speeches and some workshops on emotional intelligence. And for me, my passion right now is to get people to be unlonely by inspiring, not just connecting so that we network, but actual engagement with each other. Now we all have varying needs. Those on the more introverted side, I get it. You do, if you're more introverted, you get your energy by being alone and then you can be with other people. Someone like me, I'm more like, I need to be with other people and then I'll work it out alone. I'm, I have a higher need for other people in my life. And that's, we need all sorts in this world. And I respect you and appreciate you just the way you are. However, there is an epidemic of loneliness in America. There is a minister of loneliness in England, in Australia, that every nation that is sharing this type of information is seeing loneliness as a problem. And I like to have audiences leave my presentations inspired to connect a little deeper with each other to show up for each other, to not be afraid to reach out and let reaching out be its own reward and to be open to helping and letting yourself be helped. So I do this by interaction using my, my background as an actor. I love improv games and easy ones. Everyone, a lot of people don't like to do improv because they think they have to perform and be on Saturday Night Live tomorrow. And it's not about that. It's about accepting what another person has to offer you and hearing them and valuing them and reacting. Acting is reacting. It's also listening. 
So I use this. In fact, I use improv games, games with my grandchildren all the time. And they actually asked my husband to do this for them yesterday when we were putting them to bed, helping my daughter out. And we do a story where I start a story and I stop and you tell me what the next word is. And I'm going to trust you that you're you're going to do something, you know, not to get a fake laugh, but to, and my husband said they had so much fun because they named the characters. They said what the characters did next. And in improv, we call that accepting an offer. If I say to you, oh, mom's going to kill us. My offer is that we're siblings. And if you don't <laughs> accept that offer and you go, what are you talking about? We're not related. That like, that just explodes the whole scene. It doesn't go anywhere. But if you accept my offer and build on it, then we have something. And that is how life is as well. We can accept other people's, we can disagree with it. We can build on it. We can, you know, do another point of view, but social media has left us so solitary that I, my mission and my passion is to help other people reconnect so we can be happier and then get more done. Oh, that's amazing. And, and these are live stages or as well as, uh, virtual stages how how do you change I the world? prefer I prefer live all of us had to do virtual for two reasons one covid two three reasons I guess travel expenses and three the technology is there you know zoom is amazing I mean you and I are talking on zoom and I'm looking right at you and and so the problem with it is it becomes a substitute in our minds for real life interaction and it has its place absolutely but i prefer in person because there's something that happens in an in person exchange that i believe an actual woo woo you know exchange of energy <laughs> that occurs so i think this and zoom and social media are good placeholders but i'd prefer to do these in person however if you do get the zoom opportunity as we're having then there's ways to make the most of that I, I contract with a company that teaches more effective and connected email writing. And I do all of those on Zoom. But even then, I like to say, you know, hold something up that you like. Tell me what makes you happy in a day when you're not at work. Like, just give people a chance to share something of themselves. So there are things you can do virtually to help. But I will say that this kind of work is most effective when people are gathered together, like doing theater. Even gathered together in a movie theater to watch a movie is different from watching it in your living room. It's, other people are wow. laughing. This right? is powerful. Especially, we yeah. are living in extraordinary times. I believe the the online, let's say Zoom, even social media, because I will share this interview, which is recorded now on five, six social media channels and send it to my list. So by you doing your both stages online and offline i believe the magic is now being in front of people in in australia in 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 front of in front of faces in europe which is in my audience yet you may not have ever been in these countries it's it is a extraordinary tool to now share a message and to plant seeds for people to start, restart, readjust, save themselves with, with your help, with my help as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're doing some amazing work. And when I heard a bit of you, and we met on Zoom, we met in a group and we just picked up the connection afterwards and talked afterwards. So I, I've looked into the work you're doing and your life story, which I'm sure your listeners know, and it's extraordinary. Being able to share, I think people generally need to learn their own lessons, but we help each other through empathy and kindness and not pushing ideas. So like even my book, Happier Made Simple, which I wrote in response to a lot of people 
so I'll back up a bit. When my son develops schizophrenia, which is a heartbreaking illness, especially because people with schizophrenia often don't know they're ill and they don't want your help and they resent your help. My son is a kind, gentle person and he still does not believe he has this illness, but it's clear and I'm doing my very best to advocate for him, support for him and not give up on him, but also honor the boundaries I have for the other people I love. I wrote Ben Behind His Voices a decade ago, although there's an updated audiobook version, to share our story because by sharing our stories, then people can take their own lessons from it. Instead of me going, let me tell you what I learned. Here's my story. What do you take from it? So that is a memoir, and it led to a lot of opportunities to speak to audiences about the family experience with mental illness. I spoke in Warsaw, Poland, which was amazing. I had never been in a country where I knew zero about the language. I'd been to France. I'd been to England. I'd been to Paris. Um, that's in France. I know. I'd been to places where there are romance languages, so I could sort of guess, and I spoke a little French. So but Polish, I knew nothing. I, I walked around feeling illiterate, which I basically was. So I got to speak in Poland. I got to speak in London. I got to speak in many places in America. And people would say to me, how come you're still laughing? Your son has this serious incurable illness. And it's the same thing when my husband left. I'm like, I can't wallow. Look, you got to process. You have to process pain and trauma. You know that. But after a while... Most of the time to choose to say, all right, it is what it is. Now, what am I going to do? Or all it, all will be well, maybe just not the way I expected it to be. Or I'm going to handle whatever happens, I'll handle it somehow. So I found there were seven core phrases that I would tell myself to give myself strength to get through things. So that resulted in happier made simple because I, it's not a lot of theory, but it's just enough. And seven core phrases also on this mug. Oh, I can't see it. So there it is. There it is. Oh, oh, um, what was that being? It's okay. So it, it spells out breathe. I'll read them to you because it's, okay. um, and, and you can see this on my website, uh, randyk.com. Being, it spells out breathe because we all need to breathe. Being, and the phrase that triggers good things in me is be here now. Like the coffee's not done, be here now, right? Reality, it is what it is. Engagement, that's huge for me. And missing from a lot of happiness books is that we're all connected. One of the most powerful things I've seen done and I have done as a presenter is get people to talk to each other and say, you know, team up or in, until you find three things in common and then come back to the room. And it's amazing that we're all different, but we're also all connected. And to remember like this mug, I didn't make it. Somebody invented a mug, somebody created it. Somebody was in a factory, somebody, we owe everybody everything. So remembering we're all connected is engagement. A is appreciation saying, this is good. Like, this is so good. I'm so glad to talk to you. T is trust, all will be well. H is humor, also missing a lot from happiness movements that I've seen as a radio personality. I learned to look at, not trauma, I'm not talking about trauma. Trauma's not funny, but inconvenient things can be funny. Mm. I mean, I once backed out of my garage, but forgot to open the door first. That's funny. It wasn't funny at the time, but eventually once it was fixed, it became funny. And just going, is that interesting? Is humor has gotten me through a lot. And E is esteem. Whatever happens, I'll handle it somehow. Because sometimes things aren't going to work out the way you want it. If it rains on your parade, all right, I'll open an umbrella. Like, I'll figure it out. So those are the seven core phrases that I speak about with stories in, in my book. And what gets me through, even, even now, there's always more to learn. Everybody's each other's teacher. And that's another thing that helps. Wow, well, that's yeah. wonderful. And <laughs> if things go well for you in the next five years, mm. what would you be celebrating? What a fantastic question. I will be celebrating reaching more people by booking keynotes with larger audiences and the fact that people come away from these presentations encouraged to engage with each other. And maybe they'll say, wow, my life is better. And I remember one thing I heard from Randy that in that 
encouraged me to knock on that door or encouraged me to show up at that person's party or whatever it is. So I will be celebrating being able to have touched as many lives as I can touch in this lifetime. We, we all have a journey. I will be celebrating getting my health back because I've had a cough since COVID and we're working on it. I will be celebrating making people laugh. Uh, I am working on a solo show, which I can combine with my keynotes because I do love to perform as well to, as to talk. And I'll be celebrating my the health of my family and my grandchildren growing into being nice people. What will you be celebrating in five years? Uh, what a good question. Probably living more in harmony, areas of life, probably more aligned to those needs that are with my children, with my wife. I love my freedom. We had traveled recently for over three or four months, looking for a new place to live in Europe. That will possibly be in Hungary next, where we settle. Getting clarity now. Uh, probably impacting more, more people in the millions to reconnect to their true or authentic self that I call it, to, to have their own game plan in life rather than stuck in someone else's goal plan or agenda, which is the case for a lot of people on this planet. It's true. It's true. And, and that's beautiful. Awareness is the beginning of change. Mm. And I was recently pleased to participate in a, just as a, as a participant, not a speaker, in a, a workshop about a vision boarding for 2024. And a core question was, what makes you feel proud? Not my father would be proud of me. My mother would be proud of me. Audiences will love me. But what makes you feel proud of you? And to always come back to to that core, which was very powerful, because I think if we're not aware of what we're trying to undo from our childhoods or what we're trying to live up to that we're not aware of. But once you're aware of what you do, that's a game changer, even without trying to change. If you go, I mean, that's how I got to a successful second marriage for someone who would never do what my husband did. I, I went through what I call relationship high school. It was just kissing a lot of frogs for 16 years in between husbands until I figured out what I really did need. And one of the things I really did need was to accept myself with all my own flaws and then to find a man that would love me the way I love myself, even though I don't like to cook. So it was, you know, but it's it's that awareness of going, Oh, that's just me doing that thing that I do. And I'm looking for to fight the battle I used to have with my father before he passed away and I didn't resolve it. Like if you're aware, then you can make some changes. Wow. So self-acceptance. Ladies, if you're listening, mm -hmm. whatever quirkiness you have, you're still valuable, whether you love or can cook or not. Right. Or driving. choose not to accept. I told my husband when we were, <laughs> excuse me, there's that long COVID cough. Um, when we were dating and I, I had gotten to this place where I was just like not feeling stressed to go, oh, now I have to cook him dinner. Oh, I don't know if I can get married again. Oh, what if he snores? Like, you know, all of those doubts that go into your mind. And I was just like, Okay, honey, let's have a little conversation. And if you can find a sense of humor about yourself, this this came from a magazine article I, I read. Like you never know how something can touch somebody else. And I don't remember who wrote it, but she said, you know, when you have a crush on someone and all their little quirks are adorable. So if you can see your own little quirks as adorable, that's a really good key to self-acceptance and true love. So like, and that's when I said, okay, that's a little quirk I have. Isn't that adorable? I'm really worried about cooking him dinner because I don't want to. Hmm, does that make me less of a woman? No, it just makes me me. And I, with great confidence and humor, I just said, so you need to know a few things about me. 
One thing is that I don't really like to cook. I can, I'm good at it, but I don't really, doing it every night would just make me crazy. But if we live together and we get married, if I ever do cook, I'm an actor and I need applause. Like I need you to say for the next three days, that was such a good meal. <laughs> and, and he laughed and he said, that's fine. My mother never cooked. It's not an expectation I have. And you know what? To this day, he does it. If I cook a meal, I get applause and, and you know, and it's a joke between us, but it comes from that self-acceptance. And yes, ladies, I would say that old cliche, you know, love yourself is true, but love yourself isn't a pressure to be perfect. Love yourself is going, oh, I'm an imperfect human being. Isn't that interesting? And mm. you know, fix, fix what you can. And know that you're worthy of love anyway, unless you're judging yourself. It's a beautiful formula that you've been sharing with us, starting with accepting oneself mm -hmm. that evolves into more and more appreciation of the strengths that may have or the genius, because everyone has it. Mm -hmm. And when we're working on our genius, then all these little gaps of, of skills will become either a good joke or just the quirkiness that you know who we are what have i not asked you randy that you might have wanted to share in this interview as time is running out slowly oh it is i well actually we've gone over actually i think i I think you've asked beautiful questions. I, I There's nothing in my, I'm taking inventory. There's nothing in my mind right now. I guess my my website, uh, you know, have people get in touch with me. So my name is Randy K and both of them are spelled with a Y-E. The E's are silent, but I talk a lot. But um, so it's R-A-N-D-Y-E-K-A-Y-E.com. And on that website, you'll see my work as, you know, behind me, by the way, is a voiceover booth. I, as That's one thing I do as an actor as well. I do a lot of voiceovers and uh, audiobook narration. So that is a way and was a way to stay home and be with my kids at the time. So you'll see my voiceover work, some of my acting work, my speaker information, the information on the books. It's all there. And, and the blog posts when I feel like writing, which is not that consistent, but... I'm where I'm working on one right now. You want to know what my blog post is going to be this week? Next week, I'll write about you or next in two weeks, whenever I do it. But I've been watching this is the last thing I'll tell you because you didn't ask because you didn't know. So I'm wondering why you don't have a gold medal and I don't have a gold medal. Why Diane and I know Diana and Naya doesn't have a gold medal, but you get what I'm saying. Like I just watched that movie about her incredible journey and persistence in swimming from Cuba to Florida and, you know, brava, Diana and I add. However, I bet you have a lot of clients who deserve a gold medal for raising kids alone, for combating, from coming back from suicidal ideation, from, you know, where's the TV movie for us? So that's, that's my blog post this week. There's always a little, it's, it's just, it's called a spark. There's a story in a picture, an action step, a resource and a kick-ass quote. That's the spark. Um, so that's what I'm writing about. And I think we're all here. Like this is your podcast, right? We're all heroes. And if, if the world doesn't recognize it, maybe we can recognize it. Wow. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful conversation and all your details, website and books and acting will be under the video if someone is looking for it. Uh, it was a great time and I will hope to see you soon. I hope so too. It was a pleasure. Really nice getting to know you even better. Thanks and see you later. <laughs>